Awesome to welcome Orlando Magic Director of Player Development and Basketball Operations, Becky Bonner, to the Basketball Podcast. In her role with the Orlando Magic, Becky drives the personal and professional development of the Orlando Magic players. She performs a wide variety of on-court and off-court tasks, including scouting and player evaluations, implementing facility upgrades, and inspiring personal and professional growth to help players maximize their NBA careers on and off the court. Bonner played basketball in college at Stanford University and Boston University before playing professionally in Europe. She's been on the coaching staffs of the University of Maryland and the University of Louisville. She worked for the NBA as part of the league's basketball operations and was in an operations support role for USA Basketball and the national men's team for the 2014 World Cup and the 2016 Olympics. Becky, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Exciting times for you. Uh, filled a lot of roles in basketball already and uh, looking for another one. Uh, you're on the record of saying, I want to be a GM. And I'm just wondering, uh, what are the advantages of saying this openly and directly? I'm not sure what the advantages are other than it being, you know, a personal goal of mine. Um, I'm a very driven person. I always have been, whether it was in my schoolwork when I was younger or on the court playing basketball. And so no matter what, you know, my older brother and I laugh. We have this thing where if you're going to put your mind towards something, no half stepping. And so if I want to work for a team in basketball operations, I don't want to just be here to be here. You know, I want to take it all in, soak it all in, learn from everybody that's been doing this a lot longer than I have. And then hopefully um, become a qualified candidate to become a GM of a team in the future. Like a lot of my colleagues, male colleagues that have done it before me. Love that. And uh, I'm, I'm curious then with this path uh, that you're on, how does coaching development and your personal coaching development help your preparation for a basketball operations position? You know, having the experience to be in the coaching world, um, you know, last season I spent time on our coaching staff under Jamal Mosley, our new head coach, and being, having that experience really helps you seek to understand and, and see where people are coming from rather than maybe you, you have an, an idea of kind of what it's like to go through that, but you've never actually, you know, done the work and been there and felt it, experienced it, touched it. Um, and so I think it just gives you great perspective as you go forward in your role. And I'm curious then, obviously part of the GM's role is hiring staff and specifically potentially a head coach and assistant coaches as well. So does that help influence that in terms of how you would approach hiring different types of people? I think so, because it gives you the experience. I mean, at the end of the day, this is really all about our players, right? And so we're all just, in a, it's really a service role and we're serving them to help them be the best they can be. And maximize their careers. And when they're doing their best, hopefully that translates into winning and, you know, winning, we're in a very cutthroat industry and that's what every, all 30 teams are trying to do at different stages of the, of the game. Right. So understanding what, what winning looks like, I think is a very special quality having been a part of some very interesting, like great winning opportunities with my time in the USAB or whether it was with a college team or whatever I've done or being the sister of someone that spent a lot of time at a very winning organization. I just think that that experience is almost like getting your master's in this world. It's great stuff. And uh, you mentioned the service role. So one of the things that uh, I guess has been mentioned is one of your roles has been inspiring personal and professional growth to help players. And I'm curious beyond the basketball part, can you, can you let us know some of the things that uh, you feel are best practices in helping do that for players off the court. Absolutely. I think that the goal is that when the player shows up to work, which is in our world practice, right? The minute they step in foot in here, that that's what they're able to focus on. And, you know, what can we do to help with that? Is it getting your driver's license because you've never driven a car and that makes you feel more comfortable or you just relocated to a new city and you're really unsure of what that looks like first time living on your own and all of that stuff or you're in a serious relationship and you want to take it to the next level. How can we help you with that? And being in a great headspace and taking like a holistic approach, I think allows you to then completely dive into your craft, which is being a good basketball player and, fo and focus in those, in that 
what is it, two hours of um, practice, whatever your, your commitment, time commitment is that day. And I think that having that ability to be there outside of the lines helps build trust inside the lines. And I imagine a lot of that has to do with creating, a, you know, an openness, a relationship with the players, and particularly for some of those things you just mentioned, which are great examples, to get them to be a little bit vulnerable in sharing with you or someone else on the staff. So I'm wondering, do you have some best practices for forming those relationships and creating that openness? You know, I think that every, if you ask that question, you know, you could get 30 different answers around our league of how they approach it. And I, I think ultimately it comes down to being yourself and who you are. And so I'm very self-aware that perhaps I'm not for everybody. That's okay because not everybody in the world gets along or has the same um, beliefs, but the beauty of our sport is basketball brings us together and we're, you know, we're on this, we're teammates at the end of the day and we're on where we all love the game. We all serve the game and that's what we have in common. And to me, that helps us Whenever we could go astray, that brings us right back to baseline. And that's what we have. That's our common goal and things that we can relate upon. Building relationships is, like I said, all about being who you are and authentic. It's a commitment and a time commitment. And it might be inconvenient to go to, to be at practice and sit there and wait for them, a player to, you know, walk out of the building because sometimes they go and they get massages, they get all this stuff, but you know, you're committing your time to be there for, have an opportunity for a touch point and be there for them in a conversation. And I think there's a lot of value in that. It's a tremendous value behind that. And uh, one of the things in reading about you a little bit is uh, obviously team dinners. And I imagine that comes from Matt and San Antonio a little bit, the value of those, but even diving deeper, what you, what you're talking about is you're actually orchestrating some of this it's not just left up to the players and uh, that that seems to be a very practical point for coaches to understand how deliberate and intentional it is for you to even where they sit at a team dinner isn't it absolutely i think there's you know some strategy involved but our our roster you know for i can only speak for our team right now and where we are we're very young and it's kind of, and while they are adults and everything like that, I, I just remember when I was 19, I don't think I'd ever ordered a filet or, you know, and had these experiences of being dining in a restaurant where, you know, your napkin goes on your lap and there's like a learning curve, right? And even understanding what's on the menu and all of that. And so just being there and having, going through some of those moments together only gives you like another experience to uh, outside, like I said, outside of the court to get to know each other and, you know, fellowship over a meal. I mean, I'm so fortunate to have been raised by parents that, you know, every night we ate dinner together. And so it reminds me, cause that's what I know. It reminds me of that. It's like, okay, we just did whatever we did for the day. Now we're at dinner. Tell me about your day. I'm sort of just kind of copying what I've known my whole life. You know what I mean? And uh, probably we're thinking about similar things in terms of family dinners. There were no phones because phones didn't exist. So in, in a practical sense at this point, are, are we removing phones during team dinners or how do we handle that so that they actually interact with each other? This is the NBA. I'm not in the space. I'm not going <laughs> to tell an NBA player when he can or can't have his phone. I just don't feel comfortable doing that. Hopefully. I'm entertaining enough to keep your attention, but you know, <laughs> things come up and they, they, these guys are CEOs, multi-million dollar entities, and they have a lot going on. And so if, if they need to ha take a phone call or be on their phone at dinner, I won't take offense to that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would assume at this point, that's the way it is. So that's mm -hmm. great. Great insight. And uh, keeping your GM hat on a little bit in terms of, uh, you know, your personal belief, but uh, is your prospect evaluation process based on current skills or future forecasting of what a player could be or both. And when we talk about future players, we're not just talking about draft picks. We're talking about potential free agents, et cetera. Absolutely. I think it all kind of comes together and it's, you know, context matters, right? Case by case basis. Where are the magic at? What are we about? Um, how does that, how does that skill set of that player fit into what we're about? Obviously your craft as a player, you need to be up on like whatever you're good at always excel at that. And then of course, lean into your weaknesses and improve those. It is a projection at when, you know, when they're younger and like I said, fit context, all those things kind of matter. And, you know, we have the analytics model that helps us out as well. And so it like, it's like a science, but then it's a feel and just kind of marrying those two and it's a people thing. So uh, human experience. So marrying all that stuff together and hopefully you get 
you get it right. You know, this is a very humbling space to work. I imagine it is. And, uh, you know, particularly maybe a player that maybe struggles initially or, or whatnot in their, in terms of their experience with your organization, what are some things that coaches or, you know, administrators can think about in terms of helping that player get more comfortable and get on track? I think trying to get to know how that player learns, do they have to do it? Can they just see it visually? Do they need to write it down? Do they need to watch film? Um, and having a little bit of level of patience with the, like the way that player learns and then kind of like meeting them where they're at the younger generation maybe more used to gaming in the video or being on the with the thumbs maybe if they got to try it that way and learn the game that way it could help or maybe they minutes and you give them 10 minutes of something to focus on and then you hit them over here with something else and we go back um, i just think being open to different strategies of the way that a player can learn and retain whatever is done at practice and then bring it to the game is something to consider. That's great. And then another part of that is obviously the confidence to do it. So I'm wondering what areas or what ways can we help a player develop and improve their confidence? I think, I mean, I'm a little old school, I guess you could say, you know, for me, just my experience as a player and watching both of my brothers, you know, repetition and preparation made us confident, right? Whether it was for the basketball or the like whatever we're working on, a taking a test in school, you know, if, if I didn't prepare for my math test, I'm not going to be very, I'm, and I'm just winging it, you know, I'm not going to be very confident in myself, or I'm irrationally confident, and that's a an issue too. So just making sure that you do the work, and having self-awareness of who, about your game, and, and what you, what you can offer out there, I think is really important. So uh, maybe going to your player development uh, role a little bit there, um, is player development, in your opinion, focused primarily on new skills or is it more on improving current skills and uh, which one kind of helps a player succeed more in the NBA level? I think that's a great question. And I think it's a case by case basis too, based on that player's pathway and experience. Like if you get a player who grew late or was grew early, right? He grew early. He was a big back to basket. And now you come into our league and okay, we need to take you out on the perimeter and focus on front um, facing up and getting more comfortable in that space. That would be to your point, a new skill development that we need. Honestly, it's finding how that skill set can fit into what we're trying to accomplish out there as a team. And so it's a kind of a balance of both. Shooting is a premium in our league and making shots is um, some, a skill set that will take you far. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And uh, mm -hmm. like I, I sometimes phrase it to people too, and I, I'm sure this is part of your process is that like skill development isn't always adding something to your game. Sometimes it's removing something from your game. And uh, I'm wondering if you've thought of it that way. And then maybe if you can give us some examples of that type of process for some of your players. For us, we when we talk about our skill development with players, they have great skills, right? They're at, what are there, 450 jobs and you're here. So I think a lot of that next level stuff comes with decision-making and understanding the reads. And so we set our players up in their workouts for their development and they have to make a lot of decisions, whether it's you just throw the defender in a space where they weren't before and now you have to find the window and make the pass, or you give them a scenario that we would, would happen in the game and they need to work on that. For us as a young team, we want to empower them to be successful in the game and try to replicate that in our sessions. And uh, I, I love this space. Decision-making is definitely my space in terms of this. So let's dive a little bit deeper and uh, sure. maybe then give us a perspective on how much time do you spend on one on those situations versus, again, these small-sided games or these, these scenarios that you put players in. I imagine those scenarios are with other you know, coaches as defenders more than other teammates as defenders. So can you give us a per perspective on that? I mean, our leagues are like a very calendar-oriented league, meaning what phase of the year are we in? If it's now, you know, you can spend more time and dedicate more resources to that area. If it's in season, maybe we scaled back or it just depends on how many flights we just took, like what's going on around us and where we are at in our schedule and being mindful of that. 
working closely with our performance staff director who understands load management and like what all needs to happen and how much the heart rate needs to get to for that guy, you know? And so everything kind of has to come together with a plan before you just kind of like wing it out there for the workout out of respect for that player and that player's time. That player knows we've put everything into them and we're not just out there without purpose, right? So it definitely depends on time of year. Veteran players have their routines, right? They know what they need to do when they need to do it. And they know how to rev it up and scale it back. And they know exactly what they need. It's incredible to see the younger players. We all, you always, we always encourage them to find that veteran player and, and figure out how their routine works and then mold it into what works for them. And as coaches, our job as we develop them is to give them moments to succeed in their workouts while also working on weaknesses and celebrate the process. That's kind of a long-winded answer because it just, there's no like box check to all of this, as I said, because it just depends on where we're at and, and, and what's going on around us um, for that guy. I, don't worry. I love long-winded answers to, <laughs> to, to complex problems, right? And, yes, and this right. is awesome because you brought out a number of things that we can dive even deeper into, which is exciting for all of us. And, you know, you talked about these scenarios. So let's say, you know, you're working on wing ball screen reads or you're working on, you know, decisions out of gets or different things like that. How mm -hmm. much mixing or interweaving are we doing in terms of that? Like rather than these block segments, are you mixing different things into a workout or is that again, a progression based on time of season or the player's needs? It's my opinion, just mine. Block practice is great. I grew up that way. I could recite my practice from my freshman year to right now. We sort of take it towards more random which I think translates into retention in game. And so that's a lot of the ways that we try to tailor our workouts when we have a one-on-one, one-on-o guy. And then of course, coaches are available to fill in defensively, create a, a contest on every shot because that's replicating game-like situations. What's the why of what we're doing? Are we, we're not just shooting to shoot. We're not just passing to pass. How does that translate to game-like scenarios and pace? Let's play, let's, we're here to work. Okay, will you understand it? All right, great. Now let's play with pace. Let's get game-like and let's get our sweat going. I also think that incorporating defense into a, a pick or whether you have to sneak it in in some fashion or giving them a little bit of something is also um, really helpful too. And when you say defense, you mean them playing defense yes. or working on defensive concepts, yep. right? Yep, absolutely. And is that generally against coaches is what we would probably find rather than, yes. you know, in a live situation. Right. If we're just talking about a one-on-o -on yeah. um, before practice, let's get something done. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm curious then. I mean, I, I get it. I grew up in a blocked era as well, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and I love that you could recite that still. But I'm wondering then in this era, do you find that you would rather practice this way with more randomness and variability? You know, when we talk about practice, that's a, a little different, right? You have everyone together and uh, strategy. But when we talk about like a workout, I think a player development workout or something like that, I'm a very routine at, for me, uh, but I also like competitiveness. So I like to have, and I also don't want to just do something to do it. And I imagine other people are like that if I'm like that. And so coming up with fun stuff, like putting up some time to get a goal on the clock while doing a shooting drill or something like that. And then just challenging yourself to get, to get those goals and then expanding the goal and all of that kind of stuff. These guys love that stuff. Again, if you're in season, you don't want to kill the legs really just to develop. And again, there's different, there's a hierarchy of player in our elite, you know, in every roster, right? There's the guys that play all, a lot of minutes. There's guys that are needing to get their heart rate up because that's what it will be for them that day because they might not get a lot of minutes in the game. And there are people that are going to go on assignment and play in the G League, get G League minutes. And so you just, just understanding, like I said, having a plan and bigger picture awareness for what you're doing is obviously crucial. That's great stuff. And uh, you mentioned celebrating the process, which I think is obviously incredibly important. And uh, one of the ways that I think is easiest to do that is to notice the progress of the player so that they understand that what they're doing is helping them. And so I'm curious if you can share some of those ideas with coaches about different ways that we can notice their progress and celebrate the process. Absolutely. I think it's keeping goals, right? How many minutes did it take to do that? Whether it's a time goal or a, a numbered make goal in tracking that and making it competitive, whether it's pitting another player against an, oh, well, so-and-so just made 35. Can you, what can you do? Well, having fun with it that way, honestly, 
when they do it and they get it, celebrate it, energy, enthusiasm, positive vibes. I just, it just makes the gym feel good. Just like any human experience, you don't want to feel like it's a grind every day. This is an 82 game season through a lot of months of the year, doing what we all love to do and being paid to do it. It's an honor to be here. So let's make it a positive experience and enjoy the journey. Absolutely. And you mentioned routine, obviously, uh, you know, for different players, routine matters more at different times of year. And, uh, you know, this this comes back to the question when it comes to player development in season, how much do you feel you can actually get accomplished over the course of a season versus maintenance when it comes to development? And uh, for uh, let's not talk about the top tier players, which we know is is a different factor. But for some of the some of the players that need development, how much can you actually get done in season? I think, you know, playing in the game is the most value that you can. And so if you have a player who's not playing in the NBA game, considering getting the minutes in a G League situation is probably best for their development, because how are you supposed to evaluate them on a workout, right? From a, if you put your front office hat on and what does it feel like to be that player who is doing all the things you're asking him to do in the player development workout and, and all of the performance side and everything, and then not feel five on five and the action of playing, you know, that that's not who they are. It's not who they've been. They want to play. Everybody wants to play sitting, sitting there and cheering is great, but uh, I really think getting minutes in the game is crucial to player development. Absolutely. And uh, another part crucial to player development is obviously coordinating relationships with players, personal trainers when it comes to basketball. And uh, that's a big part of the job nowadays in terms of that, although it does seem like there's a big movement for players to be back in facilities a lot more, which is great, too. But uh, just wondering about uh, your impression of some of the things that coaches can do, because high school coaches and all levels face this now. What are some ways to be able to foster those relationships and work together in synergy with trainers? I mean, I think that you nailed it working together, you know, is that trainer watching the film and have big picture awareness of the goals of the organization or the club or the team that that player's on, you know, I'm a direct person. And if, if it were up to me, I would meet that head on with whatever relationship, the trainer that's working with anyone on my roster, come on in, let's talk. My door is open, invite that trainer to our world, right? And get to know us and understand what we're about so that when you have the player on your workout, maybe you're not doing 97 dribbles to go nowhere. It looks great, but you know, maybe less dribbling would be better for this player. Um, and we're on the same page there. Trainers are great. I grew up with one of the best trainers that we have, Chris Brickley. And I, I know my brother's team was is friends with another trainer um, from Texas. And, you know, I understand what that's like because, you know, sometimes the player just needs a different voice. You've been listening to the same group of coaches and it's, it's also healthy to get away and get with your people that make you feel good, but understand that at the end you're on a team and the team has goals. And when you leave your individual trainer and you're coming back here to embrace that process. And so I think it's just being respectful of each other's lane and, and where they're coming from. No, that's a great answer. And uh, I mean, I'm all for trainers too. And anything that gets a player excited and practicing basketball at any level is obviously a good thing. So uh, you you also mentioned, um, you know, players that are out of the rotation and the challenges with them. So I'm wondering, because all levels of coaches face this, we just have players that don't play as much as other players. So mm-hmm. what are some ways to keep them engaged within the season? Well, this is something I can relate to very well because I was a player who was not necessarily in the rotations when I played in college. So nothing to me felt better than getting out there and being competing and having the opportunity, whether it was in a three on three or a five on five with the scout guys for women's basketball, just having that time to get out there and play and compete helped me. And so at this level, right, it's not like you have scout team, you have, you know, player development coaches you could play with, you could play three on three pregame. Or if you're really not in the rotation, having that conversation with whoever and thinking about how can you get that, how can we replicate that somewhere else? And so, you know, if you travel, you get to a market and there's our optional shooting, making sure that, okay, I'm going to optional shooting and maybe we can get a run in. Not just accepting, well, I didn't play and that was my day. You can always go get what you need. It's your career. It's the resources, especially at the NBA level. 
people will do whatever you need to serve you and make sure you get what you need to be successful. And so just not saying anything or not going to get, trying to seek out competition or live play, I think would be something I wouldn't recommend. You know, nothing replicates getting in that game. Got to play. You got to play. And it's, it's obviously uh, a different way. It doesn't have to be necessarily the game, but I'm just saying, you know, you got to play fives. Well, and I'm thinking your timing and everything. Yeah. And I'm thinking about that, about your college experience and so many's college experience or even high school experiences. And, uh, you know, it's not just uh, obviously to be able to play to develop, but it's fun to play, isn't it? Yeah. So as coaches, we can create more of those situations possibly. Is that an answer for I, those yes, players that don't so. play? And just kind of like think about where, just remember where your players coming from, you know, at, you know, whenever you go from high school to college or college to pro or whatever the level progression is, when you get, you go from one level to the next level, it's going to be a new thing experience and you might not be the best anymore because you're the competition is greater, but you're so used to, you've always played. And I honestly think a lot of us junkies for the game, like that ability to just play helps our psyche and helps us um, be who we are almost, especially with these guys that, that all they've done ever by the time they're in our league is played. And so giving them that chance, whether, however it looks, I think will help them in the long run and help them stick with it and knock it down and, and, and see the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, and you mentioned the importance of decision making. I'm wondering, is that one of the most important factors for players as they develop is to be able to develop just, again, they might have skills, but better decisions make those skills better, don't they? Absolutely. I think so. I mean, feel and, you know, fundamentals are great, and but obviously talent trumps everything. Um, but um, making the right play at the right time to get the right shot and understanding what shot we want, when, and all of that is what our, our players are experts in that in our league. And it's something that they make look so easy that some people don't even realize. They think that that's easy to come by. And it's, it's really not like, that's how good our guys are and how much they understand this, like this level of play. And they're just they're truly pros. Well, we talked about creating scenarios in a workout. We talked about obviously playing basketball and uh, we haven't talked about film, but that is that another major area to be able to help players develop decision-making? Absolutely. And, you know, we all watch film different, right? And some don't know how to watch film and it's not fair to assume that they like, I would think that maybe they're just watching themselves. Right. And so what, maybe we should look over here. Maybe you should look at this defender, even though you the ball's here and, and just having a dialogue and a communication and then maybe let the player run the film session with you and see what hear from them, what they see and how it looks to them. And so I just think a daily dose of film is definitely something that I think is valuable. It's, it is for sure. And is the use of questions part of that as well in terms of Absolutely. you not giving them the answers, but helping them see the answer on their own? Yes. I think one thing about coaching is like, not about what we know right we can know all the answers but what does the player know and and so hearing from, from them and having that interaction really number one helps build your relationship and kind of creates it's respectful to hear from your peers and ask them questions as well and so asking questions and hearing their feedback really helps you understand where they're at I, I know it's it's different for every player, but uh, if we were just generalizing, one of the things I say to high school players moving to college is one of the biggest differences is defensive rotations and learning the complexity Absolutely. of defense. Is there an equivalent to that from moving from college to the NBA? I think so. I mean, our you know, in our league, you can't touch anybody and freedom of movement and, and understanding that. And everyone is so elite with their offensive skill set. How on earth are we going to get stopped? And so going through the terminology, glossary of terms and uh, philosophy and what can we live with? What, what can we give up? And all of that is very crucial and technique, really deep diving with te defensive techniques whether it's on ball or off ball, I think you have like you have to become a master at that in our especially because our players are so skilled offensively. So that defensive development, they get that in the individual workout and then they get that in the team workout. They get that in the film. Uh, are there other, uh, any other areas we're missing in terms of defensive development? I think uh, like a big part of defensive development is talking and communication, saying what you're, you see and saying what you're doing is really crucial and having someone sort of be that free safety and talking and listening to your team and being tied to your teammates is really important part of defense. And so if you don't know how to talk, which you'd be surprised, 
um, is something that a lot of teams I know at all levels are working on a lot. That is a big part of your defensive development because you could be the best defender in the world, but if you did not know that screen was coming, you're not going to get through it. And, and when we talk about they don't know uh, how to talk, it's mainly because they don't know what to say. Is that the case that we have to educate them about what to say and when? I think, I mean, I think just getting and getting comfortable with talking, what to say. So I always just say, say what you see, say what you see. And then coming up with our glossary of terms that we all agree upon and we know what that means. So the set set language of your yep. organization that everyone needs to talk about. And, uh, and that, that same language has to be used, whether it's in practice, in the game, or in the individual work, player development workout. I, I got to imagine a lot of those habits are, are veteran-led habits in the sense that the veterans model those for players more than anything. So that's got to be an important part of this process is them seeing the veterans and how they do things, right? Absolutely. It's crucial. And having great vets that understand their root, how to, what's best for their bodies, take care of their bodies, their routines, and all of the, those winning habits is something that, you know, especially for a young team like us, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And having someone to look at for guidance is crucial. And it being a player makes it a lot easier for the coaching staff. As a coach and, 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 and GM and these different roles, I mean, for all of us as coaches, especially if we're talking about NBA Twitter or whatever, one of the problems is that we tend to compare players and this oversimplification of comparing players. And I'm wondering, how do you avoid that from your perspective in evaluating a player, you know, in terms of comparing them to another player, or is potentially that a good thing? I think context matters, right? For when we're talking about that, sometimes it's easier for to understand what you're talking about to give it a comparison, right? And other times it's not helpful to what you're talking about and what point you're trying to make. So to me, I think having a unique and original thing to say about someone, especially when you're talking about a player is, is great to hear. Player comps with size and physical attributes is helpful, I think too. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. And uh, sometimes we get too muddled in the debate about comparisons and what what type of player they're like. But I, you know, in, is there any other era where players have been more unique than this one? Right. That's a great point. And also, I, I just think like you never really know who can who, no one can say, oh, I absolutely was right. Like I absolutely knew this this player was going to do exactly this for this team in this context. And so that's what I say when it's a humbling place to work, because if you think you have all the answers for this and like this subculture, I really, I can't relate to that because um, you really need to get over yourself, as they say, because this is a space where it is very competitive and cutthroat and about winning and a uh, championship and all of that. And if you think like, like no one has all the answers, you know what I'm saying? And that brings up an interesting question is like, as coaches, I mean, we know we're going to lose games and you have to learn how to brush off those losses. And as a evaluator of players, you know, you're going to miss sometimes. That's just the reality of it. Is it the same process that you have to learn how to brush those off? Absolutely. I, I, I mean, I do. I can only speak for myself. Kind of, I kind of sort of celebrate it. It's like, oh, that's an opportunity to learn or it, uh, recap the approach and see what happened and keep it moving, you know, next play. That's such a great point about uh, evaluating that and why that actually happened in terms of the loss and learning from that, just like we would learn from the decisions we made in the game as a coach, right? Exactly. And experience is valuable. You know, there's a reason why some of the top leaders in of teams have been doing it for so long because they've there's so many case by case uh, things that happen on a daily basis that you could be like oh we've never seen that before huh and then you learn okay that's the answer to that one so so i'm th i'm thinking and you can answer this theoretical not necessarily that you do this but uh in theory i'm thinking if i want to become a better evaluator of players if i create my own mock draft Afterwards, mm -hmm. I go through it and kind of evaluate maybe a few years later and say, how did I do in that process? That would be an important part of your kind of evaluation of yourself in terms of your development, wouldn't it be? I think so. Um, you know, I've I've done fun things like that for myself um, in the past, and it just builds confidence, too. If, you, you know, when you see, oh, I, I got it right or anything like that, I think any skill, whether any skill that you do, getting the repetition and the experience is just going to help you become better at it. 
I love so much of this conversation. You mentioned uh, holistic development of a player and, you know, talking about life skills. And I think a lot of us picture, you know, sitting in a classroom and having someone talk to us. And that's not what we're talking about, especially at the NBA level. So I'm wondering if you can give us insights in terms of how you connect some of these life skills for players and help them help them get some of these things uh, that will help them not just in basketball, but beyond. I mean, my experience is this area of conversation has been super informal and it's not like, okay, 12 people meet for 20 minutes in this PowerPoint presentation, right? It's um, strategic touch points that are also creative and asking questions and getting people to talk and, and saying hello and just getting to know a, a player like you would any other person that you're invested in in your life and, and really being dependable and earning and building that, putting credits in the bank with that person so that they're willing to come to you. And so just because we're put on this space together doesn't mean we're going to have a relationship that takes investment and work. Being true to yourself is, it takes consistently staying that way each day, if that makes sense. I am the way I am with in any scenario. And I, I think that gets me a lot of credits with people and could lose me some, I don't know, but um, like they know how I am. Sometimes I'm like, hello, how are you? Okay. And it's too much. And then I learn. And, and so I just think that being willing to receive feedback, being um, when you, when you are invested in someone and you care about someone, sometimes you can say, Hey, I really respect you. And because of that, I wanted to talk to you about this and giving a, maybe it's a criticism, maybe it's asking for feedback yourself. And so in any space, whether it's with a player, a coach or a colleague, this is, that's to me, the core of relationship building. And then even doing it without a transactional need purpose, it's just because you care and you want to help. No, that's a great answer. I couldn't agree more. And uh, you, you mentioned like we really can't separate the human from the player. And that's a that's been throughout this whole podcast. And so I'm curious then, are, is there anything that you're doing uh, to integrate mental skills for the player to be able to help them? Because again, you mentioned not sitting in a lecture and learning. And that's an example of how mental skills used to be taught, but they're no good if they can't be applied, right? Well, we have someone on our coaching staff that that's his job. So That's perfect. He's integrated into our world. So would he be at a player development workout? He'd be at a team yeah. practice and that anything he, he's dressed like a coach. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm mm -hmm. on. That's great to hear. And that's yeah. definitely something that uh, for the future, I mean, so many organizations have to think about. I agree. And and then, at any level. And then are they having these informal mini conversations as well? Is that how they're cueing players to remind them about different yep. things that they've worked on? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is player driven, right? What do they want from you and respecting that boundary? If there is, they don't want anything or they come to you and they open up and being there for them. Well, we've talked about so many different things, but uh, we have to talk about some of your experiences. I mean, just incredible experiences in basketball. You mentioned Chris Brickley. Maybe you can give us an example of some things that you took from him that have helped you in your career. Well, so I've known Chris, I feel like my whole life, he, him, he's the same age as my younger brother. So they were like two peas in a pod in our childhood. And the one thing about Chris is he loves the game and he's, he was just always with us. I just can't imagine when we were out of court in our childhood without him there. And so to me, his tenacity for hard work is the thing I've taken away from, from him, um, tremendous commitment to that it's no one worked harder than him and through good th times and bad times the thing about chris brickley hard worker absolutely you, you want that person on your side for sure and uh how about tara vanderbeer detail oriented and very prepared and professional there was no space where we'd be like well we didn't know they were going to do that you know we weren't ready for that you could never say that and so um and and we we practiced hard. We worked on our skills and all of that. There's a reason why I think she's the winningest coach, you know, in college basketball right now. Yeah. Her, her longevity and success is absolutely incredible. <laughs> yes. And uh, she loves what she does. No, she must love it. There must be a huge passion for all parts of it. So that's awesome. Uh, how about uh, Coach Krzyzewski? Uh, being a part of having a small window into his world was amazing and something I will always keep with me during my time with USA basketball. Um, you know, USA basketball's my, um, time there was always a span of days that were a lot, a lot in a shorter period of time. 
So it's a, we're, and you're in another place together. And so you're here, you are traveling all together. And one of my, the, the takeaways uh, from being there was how inclusive he was and how comfortable he made me to be in that setting and not afraid to speak. And I will always hold him in the highest regard for that because he didn't have to do that. And he didn't have to inc- include me or throw me out there in certain scenarios. And he did. Becky, this has been tremendous. And as we wrap up, uh, a curious question, maybe. Uh, obviously, interviewing for a coaching position may be a little different in my mind from interviewing from a potential GM position and uh, maybe future forecasting. Let's uh, let's put your uh, thinking hat on and see what uh, what might be some of the differences in terms of those type of interviews. I think um, things that they, they have a lot in common, but the one thing I've noticed are the, the NBA team staffs are a lot, a lot larger than they used to be, right? And there's a lot more niche, like specific roles. You don't have to wear as many hats. Like, no, you just do team travel and you do the equipment and you do the facility. And maybe in the past, the athletic trainer did the athletic medical and the travel and, you know, and so they're really building out the staff, which makes a lot more people, which makes the leader's role as the GM managing all the people and getting the right people in there on the same page and and having um, alignment across the board. So I think that is a big part of the role. And, And then, of course, you report to your owner, your governor, your owner, um, and you work closely with the business side. And so just kind of getting every, all hands on deck on the same page and how you build that out is, you know, is who you are and your approach. And so we don't need to get into all of that. Of course, everyone, there's many ways to be successful, but at, you know, at the end of the day, you want to be the winner. You want to be the champion, right? At the end of the season. And so how do we get to there? Oh, I love it. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's going to be so fun to watch the rest of your careers unfold and you've already done so much and uh, grateful for you, for you taking some time and sharing with us. I appreciate you saying that it made me feel very uh, good. And um, thank you for having me today to, sh- to talk out with you.